I would like to welcome you uh, to this uh, briefing uh, focusing on the humanitarian uh, crisis in uh, Yemen. Uh, the title we chose for this briefing is, reflects kind of the sentiment of most people who are concerned about the situation, and I see uh, quite a few of you involved with NGOs that have been working hard uh, to put an end uh, to this misery, to this uh, conflict, uh, particularly in the humanitarian uh, level in, in, in the country. Uh, it wasn't uh, by accident that uh, these days people describe it as the worst man-made humanitarian crisis of our time. And uh, I don't need to tell some of you who have been there and who continue to work there uh, about uh, the intensity uh, of this uh, conflict. Uh, we're still getting some guests coming in, and, uh, but we'll go ahead and start in order to uh, basically not go uh, over time. Some of you need to get back uh, to your desks, uh, to your work uh, today. Uh, so let me say a few words and set the stage uh, for the uh, panel. Uh, essentially, as you will know today, uh, the, the timing for this panel is not accidental. As you probably already know, um, Yemen is, is, is the key word, the operative word today. It's being discussed uh, at the White House uh, uh, in a couple of hours. Uh, and it's being discussed already uh, on Capitol Hill at the, on the Senate floor uh, this morning, uh, discussing the Senate resolution uh, 54, uh, focusing on uh, war power acts and its impact on U.S. involvement uh, in, in Yemen, participating in at least logistically uh, with the uh, fighting there. So we figured that uh, Yemen is, is the operative word today from uh, the White House to Capitol Hill uh, to the National Press Club. So uh, uh, again, thank you uh, for attending this briefing in spite of the weather today. I don't know how your traffic was, but mine was miserable. Uh, coming from uh, Virginia suburbs, uh, it took a little bit longer today than, than, than usual. Thank God the snow hasn't arrived yet, so it could be worse. Um, ladies and gentlemen, as, far as, as uh, you know very well, according to UN, agencies and human rights organizations, uh, some of whom are represented here. Uh, the Yemen war that began uh, in the spring March uh, of uh, 2015 has taken a terrible toll in, on the Yemeni population uh, with uh, kind of a whole huge uh, gap of estimates in terms of the price, uh, the human price that Yemen has paid. Uh, you see quite often in the media that we're talking about 10,000 to 13,000 uh, dead people uh, throughout the, the, those uh, three years of conflict, but the actual numbers I'm being told from practitioners and people who know that the numbers reach much, much higher, probably even 10 times uh, that high. People talk about at least uh, close to uh, actually 100,000 uh, victims uh, to this war. And uh, the estimate, of course, of, of civilians talk about at least uh, five to 6,000, uh, but again, if we take the higher numbers, it's the similar percentage, if you will, uh, of the higher number uh, of uh, civilians uh, killed uh, during this uh, conflict. Uh, the conduct of the war has been quite brutal, and uh, we have noticed and continue to notice on the news, civilian markets, hospitals, schools, <coughs> residential areas, and other public and private uh, structures targeted uh, by various sides in violations of international law, indiscriminate uh, shelling, disproportionate and unlawful airstrikes, uh, the use of cluster uh, munitions, anti-personnel landmines, and other banned or uh, restricted uh, armaments or weapons have been used. Uh, parties to the conflict have resorted to arbitrary detentions, torture, enforced disappearances, and blocking access uh, for uh, those of you in the humanitarian business, you are familiar uh, with that in terms of blocking access to humanitarian supplies, which hasn't been easy uh, to get to the needy uh, people uh, in Yemen. The international community, frankly, has been quite negligent in holding all parties uh, to the conflict responsible uh, to these violations. And with all due respect, there is plenty of blame uh, to distribute uh, across the list of participants uh, in this conflict. The UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, uh, Zaid Raad al Hussein, stated recently that the reticence of the international community in demanding justice for the victims of the conflict in Yemen is shameful 
and in many ways uh, contributing to the continuing horror there. Consequently, uh, UN Special Envoy to Yemen, uh, Ismail Waljid Sheikh Ahmed, resigned in frustration over what he termed as, I'm quoting him, a destructive pattern of zero-sum politics that has plunged uh, Yemen into ever deeper poverty and desolation. He called on all parties again uh, to the conflict to cease hostilities, reactivate negotiations aimed at a peaceful uh, settlement. It's been, like I said, uh, a catastrophic situation as a result. Uh, war, of course, we all acknowledge. Uh, some of us have witnessed uh, you know, quite a few uh, acts of war uh, over a lifespan. Uh, war is ugly, and it's always harder uh, on uh, civilians. Yemen, of course, is not an exception uh, to this universal uh, rule. However, when you get to the point where disease and starvation become uh, eventually more threatening than actual combat, you have to really uh, kind of rethink uh, that conflict in terms of its justification or its, the rationale for it. After three years of unrelenting war and a destructive pattern, as I said, of, of uh, uh, zero-sum uh, politics, Yemen uh, is facing catastrophic conditions, according to UN uh, officials. Uh, John Ging, UN aid operations chief uh, in Yemen, characterized living conditions uh, in the country as the world's worst humanitarian crisis, as the country faces a growing risk of both famine and disease, including uh, cholera. The statistics are well known to everybody, but again, to kind of dramatize and set the stage for our panel, let me mention just a couple of them. More than 22.2 million Yemenis, uh, three quarters of the population uh, of Yemen, uh, according to UN sources, need food assistance, including 11.3 million people in acute need who urgently require assistance uh, to survive. Over 2.01 million Yemenis are internally displaced, or known as IDPs. 89% of Yemeni IDPs have been displaced for more than a year now. Over 1 million Yemenis are recipients of core relief items since March 2015. Over 280,000 uh, Yemenis are refugees and asylum seekers, and thank God it hasn't been like other countries in the region flooding uh, neighboring countries with refugees or flooding, uh, maybe because they can't leave uh, <laughs> to start with, uh, but uh, at least uh, it leaves the misery uh, that they are facing a little bit more uh, restrained, if you will. In terms of the cholera, you all know that uh, yesterday, actually, uh, a German newspaper, uh, uh, Deutsche Welle, more than, said more than one million people have been infected thus far with cholera, uh, and this is just since April uh, of 2017. Poor sanitation, of course, and lack of clean water contributed to the, to the epidemic. The last few weeks, we have even started hearing about uh, diphtheria. The World Health Organization announced this past Friday, uh, March 16, that diphtheria outbreak has spread rapidly nationwide in war-torn Yemen, infecting more than 1,300 people. This represents uh, the first such rise in diphtheria in the country since 1982. According to uh, the World Health Organization statement, children and young adults account for almost 80% of cases and more than 70 people have died uh, thus far. Uh, they have embarked, uh, and, and we are grateful for that, uh, on a vaccination campaign targeting 2.7 million people, which is only a fraction, of course, uh, ten, one tenth of the population uh, of uh, Yemen, uh, mostly focusing on children, and uh, they are now. The campaign is uh, launched in about 11 uh, of the 21 governments uh, that uh, are included in uh, in Yemen. Uh, the most miserable part of the crisis is the children, according to UN Office for Coordination and Humanitarian Affairs. A generation of children in Yemen is growing up in suffering and deprivation uh, un unknown, uh, particularly when you consider Yemen being the poorest, if you will, uh, in the Arab world. Uh, th that is uh, not very comforting. Nearly two million uh, students today, as we meet here in Yemen, are out of school. That's a huge number. 1.8 million children under the age of five are acutely m malnourished, 
including 400,000 who suffer from severe acute mal malnutrition and are 10 times, what, what that means, they are 10 times more likely to die if they do not receive medical treatment immediately. To help us uh, answer some of these questions in terms, or the main question of, of this uh, gathering, uh, is it possible to stop this misery, this conflict uh, in, uh, in Yemen? We have three of the most qualified uh, people in town uh, to uh, engage in discussion uh, with us. Uh, I'm not going to go through uh, their full bios. Uh, they are available to you in the document you picked at the front desk. If you haven't on the way out, please pick one. Uh, first uh, will be Abdul Wahab Al Kipsi. Uh, who will give us uh, basically a perspective, internal perspective on the situation in Yemen from a Yemeni American uh, perspective and a practitioner uh, perspective. Abdul Wahab is managing director uh, for programs at the Center for International Private uh, Enterprise, uh, non-profit affiliate of the Chambers of uh, Commerce, U.S. Chamber of Commerce, and has been involved uh, in uh, Yemeni politics uh, since I met him the first uh, time when he was seven years old, actually. <laughs> uh, he comes, uh, he hails <laughs> from a family of uh, Yemeni leaders. Uh, both uh, sides of the family have been involved in, in politics uh, in Yemen, and uh, our relationship actually goes back more than, uh, I hate to, to reveal our age, but <laughs> goes back more, more than three uh, decades. Uh, next, uh, our uh, friend, uh, Dr. Nabil Khouri, uh, who is a non-resident uh, senior fellow at the Atlantic uh, Council at the Rafiq Hariri uh, Center for Middle East uh, Study, those of uh, Middle East. Uh, those of us who have been uh, st students or analysts of the Middle East know the name uh, very well. He served for more than 25 years uh, in the Foreign Service, uh, including uh, a long uh, period uh, as uh, Deputy Chief of Mission uh, in Yemen, and he knows definitely more than anybody else uh, U.S. policy and the challenges for U.S. policy in this uh, conflict, and he will be focusing in his remarks uh, on this issue. Uh, last but not least, our good friend Christian uh, Colts Erickson, who came all the way from uh, Washington State uh, to be with us uh, today. Uh, he's uh, a fellow at uh, non-resident fellow at the center, but he also serves the same in the same capacity at the Baker Institute uh, in uh, Texas, and uh, he, of course, is one of the most common faces and voices uh, on the Gulf uh, in general in U.S. media and academia, and including uh, the conflict uh, in, in Yemen. With that said, we will basically follow that order uh, in which I introduce the speakers and just wanted to let you know that uh, there are cards and pencils left on your seats. If you have any question or uh, remark, uh, please fill those cards, indicate your name, your affiliation, and write legibly so I can uh, read uh, the questions from the podium here, address the, your question to any uh, specific uh, speaker or to the panel uh, at large and uh, we will be more than glad to cover uh, most of, of the questions that are submitted to us. When you're ready, just raise your card and a staff will pick up uh, the card uh, from you and uh, bring it up here. Uh, again, welcome, and uh, let me start with uh, Abdul Wahab. Thank you, Khalil. Um, let me start by telling you that I called my sister this morning. It's quite an exercise to call somebody in Yemen. Thank God for uh, social media. Uh, I was able to reach uh, my sister using email. And the, um, it's like an old-fashioned two-way communications where you go, hello, how's it going? Over. And then she comes back on the other side. Yes, I'm fine. Today, we're able to fill our uh, three tanks of propane. Over. And, uh, but however, uh, it is the good news that they're able to get propane gas. They were able to fill their car with gasoline. Um, but um, there's zero electricity from the government today, zero. So they have, they're lucky enough to be able to have solar panels and have electricity. And like people who are able to, they dangle a light bulb outside their house so the street is lighted. Um, they're able to fill up their gas tank. So. Uh, even when it goes to three quarters 
uh, empty. They uh, reach a rumor. They hear a rumor that there will not be any gasoline, so everybody runs, stands in line for the entire day to fill up their gas tank. Uh, school uh, is open, Khalil in Sana'a, for some of them, but only for two hours a day. Teachers are not able to go the full day. They need to make a living. Um, the bad news is I found out today that one of our cousins who has renal failure, kidney failure, is unable to get the medica medication necessary for her dialysis, so we need to get her out, we need to find medicine, so WhatsApp groups suddenly get activated, right? So who's outside, who can send the medicine, how do we send her out? Sana'a Airport is completely blocked, uh, communication tower was bombed, so we know she's not gonna be able to go out from Sana'a, how do we get her to Aden? Uh, trip is arduous, dangerous, anyway, so just telling you some of the day-to-day -day of what they have to go through. Um, and these are the lucky ones. Um, these are the ones that have access, financial resources, they're able to get the propane, they're able to get the gasoline. As Khalil said, over 22 million people are uh, in need of humanitarian aid. Seven to eight to nine million, depending on which numbers you count, are facing immediate starvation. If this, if this goes on, Yemen will face the worst famine the world has seen in over 50 years. Um, it's also the worst cholera epidemic the world has seen. Over a million uh, people have been affected. Diphtheria, I'm not going to repeat the numbers. Khalil has. To compound all of this, uh, a million and a quarter public sector employees. These are the middle class of Yemen. A million and a quarter Yemeni public sector employees have not been paid for over a year and a half. Um, th this all in an economy that has shrunk by over 40% in the last three years. So access to things, access to goods, access to services is not there. And then on top of all of that, there's a blockade that restricts all land, sea, and air imports of anything and transportation into Yemen and out of Yemen. Um, by a show of hand, how many Yemenis are here in the room today? If, you, if I can, how many? One. Uh, this gentleman and I are one of about six to eight million people, expats outside of Yemen in 70 countries, Southeast Asia, Africa, uh, the United States, mostly in Dearborn, that send into Yemen officially through bank transfers about three and a half billion dollars a year. If you try to compare the numbers, if Yemen is able to export all the oil it can and sell it outside, it would bring in to the economy 3.2 billion. So that's the lifeline that goes into Yemen. Three and a half billion dollars a year on average. And I know it's much more because sometimes when I send money to my family, I don't use bank. I find somebody here who wants to give his daughter in school $500, so I give it to her and he gives it to my family in Yemen. So the three and a half is just the official numbers. Out of the six to eight million expats about two million of them are in Saudi Arabia. A hundred thousand of them have been deported since December. And more will be deported because of new labor laws in Saudi Arabia. Each one of these hundred thousand people is the lifeline, is the one that feeds about a dozen Yemenis. So think of how much worse the situation will be. And this hundred thousand will be followed by another hundred thousand and another hundred thousand until Yemen cannot handle it anymore until it explodes. So in short, as Khalil said correctly, this is the worst humanitarian situation in the world, by far. According to the United Nations, according to all the humanitarian organizations, it's the worst humanitarian situation in the world. And this is not caused by natural disasters. We don't have earthquake. We have, thank God, we have not had earthquakes, no flood, no hurricanes. It's completely man-made, 100% man-made. This is a humanitarian disaster because of a war waged because of political reasons, completely man-made. Um, I'm going to address a little bit the security situation and what's going on. In short, uh, most belligerents right now find war more beneficial to, be, to peace. They're worried that peace, they would lose if a peace process happens in Yemen. I'm not going to go into uh, examples, but trust me, that's what happens. And if you want to ask about any of them, ask me during the question and answer, and I'll tell you how they're benefiting by the war and how they perceive themselves losing if the war would stop. To add to that, Yemeni political parties, Yemeni tribal sheikhs, Yemeni warring factions 
have learned the art of milking Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. They will continue to milk them as long as they can. So there's no reason to stop the war for them. It's more profitable to get paid by Saudi Arabia and the UAE than to try to find a job. So again, that's a, uh, uh, an another factor. Another even more dangerous factor is that we've seen the development of criminal gangs that transcend all the different political factions. They work together. I hope the politicians would work together like that. No, but criminal gangs work to smuggle. They have Saudis, Houthis, supporters of Hadi, Southern Transitional Council, Qaeda, ISIS, all working together to smuggle goods into Yemen, develop a black market that's very, very profitable, to maybe smuggle drugs and other contraband into Saudi Arabia. And yes, reports are now that they're also uh, dealing in the arms trade. Right, so that's how Houthis get their weapons. They sell, they buy weapons from others. So um, security situation is not getting better, it's getting worse. And again, the belligerents are benefiting from the war and they feel they would lose uh, from peace. A little bit about the political situation. And for this, for just for the sake of this discussion today, um, I wanna assume that the two major uh, elements of this, of this of the political situation are the Saudis and the Houthis. I'll leave the southern component till later. We can discuss what's happening in the South because I genuinely feel peace would bring maybe more conflict in the South. There's a lot of conflict right now buried that's under the surface that will explode later. But let's discuss the Saudis and the, the Houthis. They are the main uh, two parties to any peace process that can happen. They need to, they're, the, they're the two parts that need to agree on, on peace. But there's tremendous mistrust between the two of them. And let me say, I think they're based on phobias on both sides. Uh, and uh, from, from the uh, Houthi perspective, they have been fighting from their percep perception a defensive war since 2006 for their survival. They have felt that they've been fighting uh, against people who, if they lose, they would annihilate, uh, they would be annihilated, them and their families and their way of life. And they feel that if we stop, if we have peace, we need somehow to guarantee that we have, we're not just one element in the table of others, that they will all gang up against us. This is their perception. If it's true or not, it's up to you. But I know that they feel that way. I talk to them. If we stop, if we have peace that's not favorable to us, we will be annihilated. They'll vote against us, and they'll gang up against us, and they will finish us. You have to understand this phobia if you're able to reach a peace. You have to understand how they think. That's how they think. It's a phobia. Maybe it needs psychoanalysis. But they feel that if we stop, if, there's, if we don't have a veto power in any major decisions, we will be finished. Now, the Saudi side also has three phobias. The first phobia, and you have to think from their perspective, the first phobia is an Iran-dominated Yemen. I, I, they genuinely believe that Iran will dominate Yemen if you don't stop them. It's, if it's true or not, it's up to you, but that's how they feel. Think of Iraq and the Iranian domination of Iraq, according to Saudis. Think of Syria. Think of Lebanon. Put all of these in, on steroids and bring them to Yemen. Iran, that already is a threat for the uh, Straits of Hormuz, would be a threat to the Bab al Mandab, will be in their south. Just a geostrategic, unacceptable outcome for the Saudis. Phobia number one. Phobia number two is a Houthi dominated <laughs> Yemen, e even if independent, independent from uh, Saudi Arabia, even if independent. Uh, Saudis see Israel, Hezbollah, and what Hezbollah does to the security of Israel from the north. Do they want something like that from the south? A Houthi dominated Yemen. Uh, keep in mind that many Yemenis still lay claim to Asir, Najran, and Jaizan. And so that's a another phobia that they feel is unacceptable to them. Third uh, phobia for the Saudis is a stable, militarily strong, economically viable, <coughs> politically pluralistic Yemen that would be kind of a model for Saudi opposition with aspirations for democratic development in their country, especially in the eastern province, in the oil-rich, Shia-dominated, restive eastern province. How would that, we want this be the same. I remember in the unification of Yemen in 1990, when debate, when the parliamentary debate would be shown in, on television in Yemen, phew, every Saudi channel was watching that. We want the same. So that's also to them a phobia. Again, whether you believe it or not, that would happen, it's up to you, but that's, a phobia, I believe, that uh, they have. So as you can see, we're locked in a catch-22. Phobia on this side, existential threat, and phobias on the other side with an existential threat to them, 
And that's, that's the lock where we need to, maybe through psychoanalysis, but we need somehow to break that lock of one side feeling completely existentially threatened by the other and the other side feels the same. So I'm, I'm not very optimistic right now, but that's what the international community, that's we all, what we all have to focus on. How do we build trust amongst the two sides so we move over towards peace? And again, it's these two sides that need to trust each other to be able to find peace moving forward. Um, I'm going to try to end Khalil on a little optimistic note. I'm very uh, pessimistic, to be honest. But I'm going to try to end with a little optimistic uh, note to bring you back to 1960s. Saudi Arabia was as threatened, if not more, at that time by a Gamal Abdel Nasser-led uh, uh, Egypt that had over 50,000 soldiers in Yemen, not the Iranians by remote control. This is actually a, a military invasion, military threat. And they knew, or perceived, that the Yemenis knew that once they finish Yemen, they're going to go into Saudi Arabia. The war went on for years until the leadership of King Faisal. I mean, the solution in Yemen today needs that kind of leadership. Courage, imagination, ability to see the world, what happens, and see how to deal with it. That I don't see available right now, but uh, that's the kind of leadership that is needed. So King Faisal was able to get all the Yemeni sides into Saudi Arabia was able to have them sign the Taif Accord and move forward with the peace process despite that threat. But there were other things that were happening at the same time. There, was, there were international developments, like a little thing that's the 1967 war that had Abdel Nasser was defeated and had to leave Yemen. But uh, King Faisal took advantage of that again and developed that peace process in Yemen that ended the war. And Saudi Arabia has been influential, if not dominant, of Yemeni political life since then. Are they able to make that now? I'll leave that up to you. I hope they can. I have my doubts. Thank you very much. Okay, please. Very inspiring uh, start. Khalil, thank you very much for that uh, lovely uh, photo of me that you dug up from 10 years ago and uh, put it in the bio section. <laughs> I, I still look exactly the same, except, you know, I dye my beard white these days in, in order to look more stately and, and uh, be more... Uh, <laughs> 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 um, and, and let me, uh, there's only one Yemeni apparently in the audience, which means there are only three Yemeni political parties represented here. <laughs> uh, I, I was going to give a disclaimer because uh, the situation in Yemen is so polarized. And of course, there's a civil war uh, going on. Uh, but unfortunately, this has transported here where the scho Yemen scholarly community, those of us who work on Yemen, have become polarized as well. So some are recruited uh, for one side. We won't say exactly what that one side is. But, um, and some are uh, recruited by the other. And there's a kind of a propaganda a war that goes on. And as the old saying goes, truth is the first victim of war. So it becomes difficult to find out exactly uh, what's going on. I uh, have to tell you uh, right off the bat, in case you know, those who don't uh, follow me and know already, I tend to be very critical of Saudi Arabia. I tend to be very critical of the US government's uh, foreign policy, even though I represented that policy for 25 years uh, in the State Department. Uh, but some people think because I am overly critical of Saudi Arabia, and I don't voice enough criticisms of the Houthis that I am pro-Houthi. Uh, I don't follow all the stuff that goes on on, uh, on uh, Facebook and Twitter, especially on the Arabic side. But some friends pass on certain things to me. And there was a, a couple of uh, Yemenis. One of them was complaining that well, Khouri is, is so uh, pro-Houthi. And the other guy said in Arabic, ma baqilawsh ghair al-sayha, which means it, it, all that's left for him is to do the Houthi chant, you know, death to America, death to Israel, etc. So there are people who really uh, think that. I 
disclaimer right off the bat, I am not partisan. I do not favor one side over the other in Yemen. Uh, I, I love Yemen, I love the Yemeni people, and my only wish in my writing, I try to be scholarly and objective, my only personal uh, desire and personal preference is for peace to prevail in Yemen and for this humanitarian crisis uh, to end. And if I blame anybody, I, first of all, I blame everybody. I blame everybody in Yemen, everybody in the region. I blame the whole world for allowing something like this in the 21st century to happen. And for the whole world not falling over itself to uh, uh, rush and, and try to fix uh, this situation. When you see these heartbreaking uh, photos of babies and children and, and, and the starvation and the disease, it just, you say, how, how can this happen in this day and age? So here's, here's um, what my simple answer is to the question that Khalil posed for this symposium, how you end this. I think the, the, you end this by having the two major forces that have influence on Yemen. That's Saudi Arabia and the US. Not Iran, not anybody else. Saudi Arabia and the US. They have to focus on Yemen. It's very simple. They have been conflating Yemen with uh, their uh, issues, with their obsessions, with their demons. Uh, as Abdul Wahab was, was uh, explaining, that there are certain phobia. And therefore, you think of your phobia, you don't think of the situation that's uh, right in front of you. And I think if, I mean, that's simply said, of course, there are, there's a lot that goes into that. Um, but I know from personal experience, when I came back from Yemen, uh, I was there 2004 to 2007. And I came back, I, was, I did one year at uh, teaching at the Marine War College, but then I was back at state as the director of the Near East South Asia Office of INR, the Bureau of Intelligence and, and Research. And so I had the whole region, but really I focused a lot on Yemen, uh, on Lebanon, which is uh, my uh, native uh, country, um, and after the Arab uprising on, on Syria a great deal. But uh, in my relationship with the Near East Bureau at the State Department, and in my relationship with the National Security Council where I attended uh, the political uh, committee meetings there. I, I attended them until I got tired and frustrated and stopped going. It's always an honor to be invited, but when you find it kind of pointless, uh, you stop going. Um, I tried to turn the US government's attention, the people who are influential, in the policy, uh, on the policy making side, to turn their attention to Yemen. For the US, the big bugaboo has been terrorism, and therefore the approach has been counterterrorism. From the year 2000, when the USS Cole was bombed uh, while it was uh, moored at, uh, at uh, docked at uh, Aden uh, port. Uh, the FBI and the CIA descended on Yemen, uh, invited, welcomed uh, by Ali Abdullah Saleh, and there was a lot of security collaboration between uh, the government of Yemen and the security agencies of the US to track who did this and, and to uh, 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 build a counterterrorism strategy uh, in Yemen. And later, uh, a few years later, the counterterrorism unit uh, inside the Ministry of Interior was set up by the US and the UK. So American and British uh, military advisors set up this counterterrorism unit, uh, advised it, trained it, equipped it. It was small, but it was uh, well-trained and uh, could be uh, effective except that uh, when the war started uh, with uh, Sada in 2004, 
Unfortunately, it was directed north against the uh, Houthis and not uh, south against uh, Al-Qaeda, uh, which later became Al-Qaeda in the Arabian uh, Peninsula. Uh, so uh, I tried to say, look, uh, counterterrorism is fine as far as it goes. You have to be careful. You have to watch who is plotting against you. But the basic problem in Yemen is political and economic. And there are forces in the north and in the, in the south that are pulling the country apart. There is poverty. Uh, if you don't, if you neglect this and don't help Yemen stay together and develop politically and economically, Yemen will, will if it falls apart, will become worse than Afghanistan. So, uh, Nabil, what do you mean? What do you need? What do we need to do? You need to help in uh, diplomacy inside Yemen. Oh, you're talking about tribes and tribal conflict. You know, who wants to do that? I mean, I was literally told that. Um, economic assistance was down to like $4 million a year when I was there. And we kept pleading for, for uh, a bigger portion in assistance. I, I was also pleading for when, when the first London Donors Conference was convened, early 2006, I think. Um, I said, look, what you need is an international development fund for Yemen. Instead of bilateral assistance, you know, and especially money from the Gulf, I'm sorry, but you know, uh, most of the aid from Saudi Arabia and when I hear them bragging about aid, was put in, in pockets, in, in Ali Abdullah Saleh's pocket, in, in uh, you know, the Speaker of Parliament, tribal leaders. It was not used properly for economic development uh, in, in Yemen. And American assistance tended to be wasted as, as small as it was, and it grew later, after uh, I and Tom Krajewski, who was the ambassador there, after we left, the assistance uh, grew, and uh, at one point it reached 200 million, but actually how much of that was actually spent, I don't know, because by then troubles had uh, started and it was difficult to uh, dispense uh, the money. But there was never a pooling of resources. I talked to ambassadors in Yemen at the time. The ambassador of Qatar was very receptive. The ambassador of Kuwait was somewhat interested to say, don't do bilateral aid. You know, when you go to London, put all the money in one pot and appoint an international committee of experts to spend the money based on a rational, comprehensive development uh, project for Yemen. Uh, Washington was, was the first to uh, poo-poo the idea. You know, uh, we put money in the UN and we lose control of it. We're not going to put money for Yemen somewhere where we have no control of it. Uh, and other uh, countries that were donating were uh, skeptical, and so the idea never took off. And uh, so when you, when you look at numbers and you say, you know, so much aid was given to Yemen, it, it, don't be fooled by that number, because where did it go, how much of it was really spent on something uh, fruitful, how much of it was spent on administrative overhead? <laughs> You know, the, 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 you contract out as a government to, to some company to do the development work. And uh, they, they pocket sometimes uh, 80 cents uh, to the dollar uh, that they get. And that's always been a problem that plagued U.S. Uh, aid. Uh, but other countries have the same uh, problems as well. And so uh, <coughs> I would say I failed at trying to get the U.S. government to focus on Yemen in terms of what, uh, what Yemen lacked, what Yemen needed in order to be a strong, stable country in the region. And by saying indirectly, this is going to benefit the U.S. national interest. Because just following, and I wrote an article a while back that became notorious under the Obama administration, and by the way, I'm. I, I blast equally the Obama administration, the Trump administration. The Trump one is in a very special category, but I don't mind <laughs> blaming everybody. Uh, I, when the drone strikes started in Yemen, it was under the Obama administration. 
Uh, actually, the first one was in 2002, but there was one individual associated with the coal incident that they uh, went after with a drone. Uh, but afterwards, it, they became the, the tool of preference or the toy of preference. Uh, and I wrote an article called the Drones Do Not a Policy Make. You know, you see uh, the overuse of drones. Uh, it makes you uh, satisfied, you know, wow, you know, we, we knocked the hell out of five people. One of them, only one of them may have been Al-Qaeda. The other four, well, collateral uh, damage. Uh, I said, this is not a policy. This is not a strategy. Uh, where's the politics? Where's the economics? Where's the overall picture of where Yemen is going to be in the future? If Yemen is a strong, stable, developed country, it will take care of its own terrorism problems. You don't have to go chasing after them from here. Uh, but that's very hard uh, to sell. So uh, from the American point of view, this is the big bugaboo, the, the counterterrorism, which has remained uh, preponderant in uh, the minds of uh, the, the decision makers uh, here. And I think it's even worse today. Uh, it's at least under Obama. Obama personally had a lot of sympathy uh, for people who died in war and died out of poverty and so on. Uh, but he uh, never followed the right strategy to uh, counter the, uh, these problems. Um, now, uh, from the uh, Saudi point of view, and uh, I have to, I have to take a jab at, uh, at uh, CBS uh, and the, the 60 minute interview with MBS. Uh, there's a great piece, if you haven't seen it already, by Mahdi Hassan in The Intercept, where he says that that interview was a crime against journalism. <laughs> I, I mean, he beat me to the punch. I was watching it and tweeting some criticisms of it. But minor snippets compared to his very thorough article uh, about why that, that interview was a total fluff piece. I mean, it, if they got paid for it by the Saudi government, good for them. At least they made some money out of it. Uh, but but uh, they did not inform anybody of anything. Uh, and I won't go into the article in the short time left. Um, the one thing in it was, uh, the one mention of Yemen was, uh, what about the humanitarian disaster in Yemen caused by the war? And his answer was, Iran is hurling rockets at us, and we have to respond. Uh, and and uh, what's her name? Uh, O'Donnell just took it. And she said, is this a proxy war? Yes, he said, absolutely. And then she moved on to the next. Really? This is journalism? This is your hard-hitting uh, journalism that you uh, claim you have in this, on this show? Um, the, uh, and several, of course, in, there is no democracy in Saudi Arabia. Let's not kid ourselves. And whatever reforms MBS is, is making, he is not touching on the political system and the political rights of men and women uh, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, and uh, the, um, the idea that uh, somebody might uh, challenge these policies is totally uh, out of place. The, everybody goes out. I'm on the TV circuit sometimes, you know, uh, on Jazeera or Sky Arabia or these things. And you get somebody from Riyadh. They parrot exactly what MBS uh, has been saying. So recently, you know, the Iran uh, thing, uh, I said, uh, excuse me, the one who is firing rockets at you, very few, by the way, from Yemen, are the Yemeni Houthis. It's not Iran. Oh, but Iran supports them, and they gave them the weapons, and you know these, like you know Nikki Haley displaying that piece of metal that she picked up somewhere uh, that, that says "Made in Iran." I said, "So fine, Iran does help the Houthis, but by that logic, it is the U.S. that's fighting in Yemen and not Saudi Arabia." And, oh, no, it's Saudi Arabia that's fighting in Yemen. Okay, the bombs, smart or dumb, that are falling on Yemen are American-made. The jets that are dropping them on Yemen are US made. 
the, the uh, logistical support for that whole war, including the naval blockade, is provided by the US and Britain. So uh, if you want to use the same logic uh, that you use on Iran, then use it on who is actually fighting the Yemenis. And I, by the way, many Yemenis say it is the US-Saudi war on Yemen. That's how they describe it. And, and so you have to deconflate the issues. You know, Yemen is Yemen. It is not Iran. If you have a problem with Iran, you have to think about Iran, how you resolve the problem with them. Don't go by extension from the ballistic missiles to the, that they have, <coughs> to their behavior in Syria, to the nuclear agreement, and then to, to Yemen. When the war started in, in Yemen, Iran had zero influence, zero interest in Yemen. That has only grown over the years. And it has grown because of Saudi involvement. Uh, Saudi involvement in Yemen drew Iran's attention to Yemen. I, I will end here, and I will simply say that the US and, the, and, the, and Saudi Arabia need to be partners in resolving the problem in Yemen for their own interest. If they care nothing about the humanitarian dimension, fine. People are selfish. Nations have their self-interest. For their own self-interest, they need to resolve this problem. And they resolve it by reconciling and reconstructing. These are the two words I leave you with. Reconcile and reconstruct in Yemen. What that means, we can take up in the QA session, if you like. It means a great deal. But I think it is realistic, feasible, and must be done. Thank you for your attention. Thank the Arab Center and Khalil for organizing this event on the day of Mohammed bin Salman's visit here in DC. I live in the other Washington, and you can't help but notice how polarized this city has become over issues of equal polarization on the Arabian Peninsula. And there have been many events this week which have been celebrating the, the revolutionary Arab Spring-like developments that Mohammed bin Salman is bringing to Saudi Arabia. But of course, the war in Yemen, which began less than three months, well, less than two months after he became defense minister, a month before he became deputy crown prince, but when he was clearly on the ascendant, has to be his main foreign policy signature up until now, and it has to be taken up at a much more serious and critical level than in the 60 Minutes interview that Nabil spoke about. The war in Yemen has been an unmitigated catastrophe. It built on a already precarious and fragile situation. Let's not forget that Yemen had been through uh, rounds of fighting an internal displacement since 2004 in the Northwest with the Houthi. There were multiple conflicts already over, overlapping prior to 2014, 2015. I agree completely with the notion that not just Ali Abdullah Saleh, but his successors have known exactly which buttons to press in Western capitals to get a, a sympathetic hearing and to make the case for more resources. I remember allegations in the late 2000s when um, military equipment that had been provided to Ali Abdullah Saleh supposedly for use against Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula ended up being used against the Houthis. We see again today, or yesterday in fact, the announcement of the formation of a new security committee between the US, the UAE, and Saudi Arabia, focusing on countering Iranian expansionism in the region. And again, this is something that you can expect that Mohammed bin Salman and his entourage, and of course the Emiratis when Sheikh Tahnoun comes to town later this week, and when MBZ eventually arrives, potentially in May, will also try to play up to ensure that the humanitarian aspects of the conflict of the 
Saudis and Emiratis in the U.S. have really facilitated and made worse are overshadowed by the constant specter of, of Iranian expansionism, of Houthi proxy campaigns, as, as, as we've heard so much about, when, of course, the real objectives should be thinking here in the U.S. and in London and in other Western capitals about what kind of political pressure could be applied to try and find an end to the military conflict. I mean, for the Saudis, the conflict has already gone on far too long. I, don't, I would be very surprised in, had Mohammed bin Salman in March 2015 imagined that by March 2018, three years later, Saudi forces would still be fighting in Yemen and there would be no clear military resolution in sight. I, the cost of the war is already extremely high, both in casualties in terms of the population in southern Saudi Arabia, which is under daily uh, disruption, in terms of the cost. The military budget in Saudi Arabia is the highest um, component of the Saudi national budget, and there's also a large-scale uh, non-budgetary expenditure as well, which we believe is probably going on to the war. The Emirati is the same thing. We saw, of course, the 52 Emirati soldiers being killed in 2015, which was an absolutely shocking event for the <coughs> UAE, and which has, to some extent, created some tension among the Northern Emirates, who, to some extent, feel they're fighting Abu Dhabi's war. We see, of course, the role of uh, the Presidential Guard, which is run by an Australian and composed largely of non-Emirati forces, increasingly taking more of the, the fighting. And some of these offer points for pressure. There's already moves, I think, in Australia to see if there can be pressure placed on the Australian component or the Australian contingent of the Presidential Guard. We see the political pressure here. We see the vote, hopefully, or potentially coming to the floor in the Senate today on the, the resolution. Before I left Seattle, I asked some of the Yemeni community there whether they were planning to protest when Mohammed bin Salman comes to Seattle at some point, potentially next week. And what they said was interesting. They said, no, we're not going to protest MBS coming to Seattle. We're focusing on petitions and gaining signatures to pass to our two senators from Washington to try and get them to support the resolution. So they've made the calculation that protesting the Saudis in the U.S. doesn't help, but protesting the U.S. political system and trying to put pressure on congressmen, women, congresspeople, will be the trick. The Saudis and the Emiratis probably can guess that by November 2018, there may well be a less, uh, a less welcoming congressional atmosphere. And even if the resolution today doesn't pass or if it's kicked into a committee for a sort of delay, it could just be the testing the water for a later, a later push. So I think there are tools and pressure points that could be placed on the Saudis, on the Emiratis, on the protagonists in the conflict, which will not bring it to an end anytime soon. But if they can try to raise the political cost of this war, then that could be a longer term uh, passage. We have, of course, Kuwait having a two-year position on the UN Security Council, took up its seat on the 1st of January this year, and it will hold that seat until the end of 2019. And that potentially is a way of bringing together regional and international approaches to try and bring this war to an end. Kuwait so far, I think, has focused more on Syria. We've seen Kuwait focusing and working with Sweden, which also has a seat on the UN Security Council ending in 2018. And they've tried to focus on humanitarian reconstruction and humanitarian approaches in Syria. That arguably makes sense because Syria is less directly um, related to Saudi interests at the moment. We see so much tension within the Gulf, within the GCC, that it, it may not be the right time for the Kuwaitis to try and uh, act in ways that the Saudi leadership, which is more assertive and perhaps unpredictable than ever before, would, uh, would deem uh, hostile to Saudi and Emirati approaches. But to have Kuwait on the Security Council for the next two years, particularly as, uh, as developments may kind of occur in Yemen, 
is, a, is I think, at least a hopeful sign, as, of course, are the Omanis. The, pres the presence of alleged negotiations in Oman would be consistent with this sort of, and a sort of deep kind of level uh, secret negotiations that took place in 2012, 2013 between US and Iranian officials. And so one can only hope that if the Saudis and the Emiratis potentially feel that the cost of this conflict is becoming too high, they do at least have a, an ability to use Oman as a potential place to meet in secret and to have Kuwait as a potential uh, partner on the Security Council to try and bring together the UN aspect. Kuwait has, of course, worked in the past with the UN very closely on the humanitarian aspects on Iraq, the recent conference, and on Syria. The Kuwait has organized annual conferences from 2013 uh, through this, I think, probably last year, in, con in collaboration with, with the United Nations. And so I think those are potentially areas we can try to look ahead to. And again, just in terms of a broader picture, because it's an absolute, one of the many tragedies of Yemen is that we focus too much on the counterterrorism and on the security aspects. And I think with this White House in, in place, we will continue to do so even more so for the next two and a half, two and a half years, as we've seen with the anti-Iran front being put together. But of course, Yemen's problems go much deeper than that. Yemen's problems are ecological, they're environmental, they're resource-based. We have a country which is moving beyond its carrying capacity at a population of 24, 25 million, even without the many millions of internally displaced people who have been affected by conflict, uh, years of conflict, and uh, the last three years of unrelenting bombardment. We are a country which is running out of resources. If we do not act soon, we will have potentially large-scale ecological migrants. And of course, one of the difficulties and tragedies, again, as, uh, as um, Abdul Wahab said, was the neighboring states are not welcoming Yemeni workers in. You're not welcoming, um, you're not providing a, a welcoming environment. It's almost like you're containing the problem in Yemen, it's <coughs> as if you're keeping a lid on a pressure cooker as the pressure continues to increase. And this is going to be, at some point, a, a catastrophic situation, which would probably have to lead to massive migrant flows if, if it's not managed, maybe five, ten years down the line. So we need to move beyond just the conflict stage. We need to move beyond a focus on terrorism and security, important though they are, because also by not doing so, we potentially have the conditions for, for greater insecurity down the line. But I just don't see that the long-term thinking is there. It's constantly short-term thinking, and it's constantly also, of course, encouraged by the protagonists who have more to gain than to lose, as was said. There are attempts, I think, to map and to try to identify the flows of weapons into Yemen. That's another potential pressure point, because they would reveal that the uh, Saudi and Emirati purchases of weaponry are actually many times higher than the amounts being transferred from Iran. And again, it would challenge the narrative that has been um, put upon in, in, in the Western media, that this is a, a proxy war where Iran is a sort of elephant in the room. So I think if the, the more information that is out there as 2018 goes on, potentially into 2019 with a more balanced Congress and a continuation of this war without end with all of its political and financial costs, that could finally be some pressure point where we could have maybe begin to see a situation where the participants begin to realize that they have more to lose than to gain by continuing this war. That's my only point of hope. I don't think they're at that stage yet, but I think if they were still in this position next year with all the disease and the famine continuing to increase, then the, the PR will be increasingly difficult to maintain. And we're already seeing, in spite of the attempts to control the narrative, we're already seeing deeply critical media coverage in many cases, and especially in the UK when Mohammed bin Salman was in the UK. And I think this will become more pronounced over time. 
So trying to raise the costs, the opportunity cost of continuing, of foregoing political resolution, that will be, I think, the, the way forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all three uh, panelists for very frank and challenging uh, presentations. I appreciate your being here and your uh, input. Uh, before we uh, proceed into the uh, Q&A, let me just uh, again state for the sake of those who noticed maybe the earlier uh, invitation uh, that came out for this uh, program a couple weeks ago, we had a, a fourth uh, speaker which was a dear friend from uh, Congress who is heavily involved in the legislation uh, that came to the floor this morning. And he, uh, we on purpose uh, kind of left his name out of the program until we confirm uh, whether he will be able to participate or not. We were hoping that he would, uh, but again, the fact that uh, the uh, resolution, uh, Senate Joint Resolution 54, uh, came uh, to the floor and is being debated uh, this morning pre prevented him uh, from uh, being here at this time. Most probably, unless, as uh, Christian said, un unless it's delayed or postponed, there are all kinds of possibilities, uh, scenarios, uh, maneuvers uh, in, in Congress, but uh, it is expected that a vote will take place probably this afternoon, uh, about 4, 4.30 uh, this afternoon. Essentially, the resolution, as you will know, uh, uh, is significant in the sense that it's uh, bipartisan. Uh, it's sponsored by uh, Senators Bernie Sanders, uh, independent of Vermont, Chris Murphy, Democrat of uh, Connecticut, and Mike Lee, Republican of Utah. Uh, it is kind of a, a minority, but bipartisan, cuts across all three uh, camps, uh, if you will. Uh, but it's also significant. I mean, if it weren't significant, definitely the administration I uh, would not ask uh, Secretary of Defense Mattis uh, to send a letter to all members of Congress asking him to oppose it. Uh, the fact that the administration sees it as infringing on their, uh, if you will, uh, power uh, to participate in, in the war uh, in Yemen, I think illustrates uh, its significance. The resolution is not necessarily uh, making it illegal. Uh, for the, the, the war uh, in, in Yemen per se, but it's uh, b based on the typical congressional constitutional interpretation of uh, the War Power uh, Act. So in other words, what it's saying is that the president in March of 2015, by putting U.S. forces in the middle of this conflict, he has essentially uh, kind of uh, violated his uh, rights, and this is the power uh, bestowed in Congress to declare war, not in the hands of the president. So this is a kind of, again, historical uh, conflict between the executive uh, and the legislative branches of government uh, that we have been uh, <coughs> witnessing since uh, George Washington, I guess. And it's continuing, unfortunately, uh, today. Okay, with that said, let me uh, go to your uh, questions. Uh, Paul DeFiore, Georgetown University, do you see to all panelists, do you see any major opportunities for post-conflict foreign investment in Yemen to help rebuild the economy? If not, what are the obstacles, and if so, which sectors of the Yemeni economy? Wow. Tough one. Yeah. Uh, no, no, we we uh, should be uh, out of here by Friday, I think. Uh, no, no, uh, <laughs> absolutely. Um, for Yemen, for post, let's be optimistic and talk about post-conflict Yemen. Um, Yemeni business sector, the private sector in Yemen, is um, one of the most independent, engaged, uh, and resourceful sector in Yemen today. Um, I'll, I'll give an example and uh, a shout out for our team, the Center for International Private Enterprise. The uh, Yemeni business community has developed coalitions right now in Yemen. In five, of the, in, in, it started in Aden, now they're in Taz, Hodeida, Sana'a, and Hadramaut. Today, they're providing governance where there's no governance. They clean the streets, collect the garbage, they help feed people that are in need. 
And they, we're working with them right now to make sure that humanitarian aid is able to reach all Yemenis. Because remember, um, uh, aid that ar arrives in Aden is very difficult to get to Sana'a and vice versa, to get to Hudayda, uh, 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 vice versa. But the business community has the networks and the channels to be able to reach everywhere. So yes, and they are ready for investment afterwards. The only thing that I would uh, suggest is if foreign investment comes into Yemen, it would have to partner with the local business community in Yemen to make it succeed. And that will be the only way to move forward. Uh, uh, aid and reconstruction that would go through the Yemeni government is doomed to failure. Maybe. Yeah, uh, I agree completely, and uh, if I can specify uh, one thing that Yemen needs is water. Even when I was uh, still there in 2007, you had to dig maybe 1,000 meters in the ground to, to get some water uh, out. And uh, so there is a, a basic need for whether it is uh, desalinization or other projects, but a major water project is very much needed. Now, beyond that, there is a need for a comprehensive development plan, and I do mean comprehensive. Everything from roads to schools to small clinics to bigger hospitals. Uh, uh, the infrastructure that, that any normal society needs to live and, and thrive and for the private sector to be able to operate and function. And so what I recommended in 2006, I think is still relevant, an international development fund that would be run according to a broad plan. Here's what the country needs from A to Z, bring all the money, pull it in, and start spending it You know, one place, uh, one, one block at a time until, until you do the whole thing. Don't leave it to bilateral aid. It, it will be eaten up by corruption, by admin uh, overcost, and by inefficiencies. And uh, if anybody's interested in a reconstruction plan that's developed by the Yemeni private sector, uh, the economic reform team, see me afterwards, and I can send you that matrix for reconstruction in Yemen. Christian, would you like to add something? OK. Uh, next question is from uh, Greg Aftandilian from Arab Center, Washington. Would the Houthis be satisfied with broad uh, autonomy for their Sada province, or would uh, they somehow, uh, if that would be uh, somehow guaranteed, or would they want to control part of the central uh, government, Abdul Wahab? Um, I think it's somewhere in between. Uh, remember, they had autonomy in the north. Uh, Yemen had many regions that were autonomous. So it's not, the, and um, the plan that uh, President Hadi brought into the National um, Dialogue Conference uh, with the different uh, regions, federal, federal regions, gave them their own autonomous uh, region. What they want is to make sure that they're also part of a national government. Not necessarily control it, but if I understand them correctly, they want to make sure that the national uh, level government doesn't take decisions that, in their perception, would lead to their annihilation. That's what they felt was the target of Ali Abdullah Saleh and Ali Muhsin al-Ahmar and the other Islamists, the Islah Party, and the Muslim Brotherhood. That's they felt they wanted to annihilate them, although they had autonomy in their region. So something in between where they have, I don't want to call it a veto of major decisions, but something like that. So they have some say in national level decisions. Yeah, uh, look, the, the Houthis became over ambitious. I think their plans developed over time. Uh, they started very modest. They grew uh, after uh, Ali Abdullah Saleh left Sana'a in 2011. Uh, and then in 2014, the power vacuum uh, left by the legitimate government, which was not really governing, uh, they felt they could take over the whole country. So they were in, in 14 and 15 ambitious enough to think they could rule uh, all of Yemen. Now, uh, this grew because of the vacuum and because of the corruption and the lack of, of political agreement between the different factions in Yemen. When the war started in 2004 between the central government and Sada and the Houthis uh, there, the, the, what they wanted was their rights. What, what they wanted was a share of whatever uh, uh, the, the economy was bringing in to, to Sana'a, much like the South. You know, give us what, what our rights are, part of the national 
uh, pi. And you know, Abdul Wahab referred to the phobias from their point of view. Yes, the Saudis have a phobia of the Houthis, but it's vice versa. The Houthis felt that Saleh was cooperating with uh, Riyadh to bring in uh, Sunni Islam proselytizers into their midst. If those of you who haven't heard of the Damaj school should, should look it up. Uh, and, and it was a, a something implanted in their midst that they were quite worried about. Uh, so they had phobias, they had legitimate fears. I think they could be shrunk back to uh, their legitimate size. They are a, a part of Yemen. They should have certain rights guaranteed to them. And a formula could be found within a new government that would guarantee them that. Yeah, I think the mechanism would need to be found to prevent the capture of resources that they felt were being denied to them. And of course, other movements in Yemen felt the same way, that you had a sort of central elite in Sana'a that was cutting them out, not just of resource allocation, but of decision making, which also, I think, was one of the reasons why the National Dialogue um, failed in the way it did. And so I think a way of, again, getting the Houthis into their, back into their natural constituency, but ensuring that there were mechanisms to prevent any further sort of disempowerment would be, would be critical, and not only for them, but for all the different groups that would inevitably have to make up a political sort of post-conflict uh, Yemen. Okay, this next uh, question is uh, from Sarah Jemison from George Washington, Elliott School. Uh, do you find any merit in solutions which do not include or propose reconciling, reconstructing a unified Yemen? Addressed to all three, I guess. Go ahead. That's an that's a extremely complex question, Sarah. Um, um, it's, I mean, uh, separating Yemen, I don't know where Sarah is, so I'll address everybody, <laughs> Sarah. So um, separating Yemen into two entities that was South and North Yemen, like through a uh, <coughs> surgical precision and draw the older maps, ain't gonna happen. Uh, the grievances, uh, uh, inter-grievances between the Southerners themselves will explode. You know, right now the difference is one part supported by the Emiratis, the other supported by the Saudis, like I, like I alluded to in my, alluded to in my presentation, are se very, very serious, and they will explode into, into warfare. Same in the north. So uh, the safer, more sane approach is to try to keep it as one Yemen under a very loose federal kind of system with different provinces, autonomous uh, provinces, and then you can deal with it from a political perspective and give each part a voice. Because trying to split them into two, in my personal opinion, and based on the studies of uh, other studies from other groups, it's just not going to work. Nabil? Well, I, I agree. I think uh, uh, personally, again, uh, whether this reflects a bias on my part or uh, analysis of what might work or not work, I think, uh, I, and I don't know if you can put the country back together because it is split up right now and not just into two, into maybe five uh, entities. Uh, but I think a, an independent South uh, would not work, would not thrive. Uh, the time has passed when that could uh, work. Uh, and I think a loose uh, federation of some sort where all parts of Yemen need each other. And they're all Yemenis in the end. I mean, whether the Southerners like to call themselves Southern Arabians instead of Yemenis, they're all Yemenis. There, there isn't that much of a of a cultural uh, difference and so on. Uh, uh, so I think uh, a loose confederation, the, a democratic government with decentralization where everybody is guaranteed their legitimate uh, rights, I think that would work. It's th the longer this war continues, the more difficult it will be to do this. And so the sooner uh, that you end the war, the better for everybody's uh, sake. Uh, Christian, you want to add well, to just that? to say that there are so many fractures that don't follow need north south or any form of territorial lines that I agree with the other <coughs> two speakers that any attempt to try and formalize divisions would would just fragment and lead to further subdivisions and fighting that would just complicate an already extremely fragile situation. So I think allowing that flexibility <coughs> within a unified Yemen 
for the different groups to sort of try to prevent domination by any one group, as happened for, for so many years, is, is the way forward. And uh, Christian, let me ask you this, another uh, question raised by uh, Sarah. Uh, would you care to comment on comparisons between Yemen and Sudan mm. in terms of South Sudan? Are there any applicable comparisons there? Hmm. Or Somalia? Yeah. yeah. Well, that's a very good question. I think we've seen in South Sudan's own problems since uh, independence that just creating a new state doesn't, isn't a panacea. It doesn't resolve every issue overnight. Um, I mean, obviously, Yemen has in the past been fragmented into north and south and clearly had 23 years of very different political and economic trajectories. But I, I would still, I mean, I would, I would use South Sudan as a cautionary tale where you just open the door for further contestations of power by kind of different vested interests within the new, within the new polity. It doesn't resolve anything necessarily. Okay, Abdul Wahab, uh, Lauren would like, uh, from Georgetown, uh, would like you to comment on um, the issue of excluding women and other marginalized groups from the peace process in Yemen. Aren't, the, aren't, the, aren't these uh, the people with most at stake uh, in the conflict? And wouldn't they be the answer, if you will, uh, to uh, the zero-sum politics that you guys describe? Yes. Uh, uh, some of the most powerful voices right now on Yemen come from women. Whether you agree with them or not is up to you, but uh, on, on all sides. Uh, and the, the young people who led the February 2011 uh, Arab Spring-like revolution in Yemen still have a voice. However, uh, this is very contra what I'm going to say is very controversial, but the Gulf Cooperation Council uh, agreement and the implementing mechanism for it brought back the old same voices and the uh, same old cake to split. They did not expand the cake and did not exp expand the stakeholders in it. So it brought us back to uh, uh, square one and we're building from there. Uh, and the exclusion of the new um, stakeholders that definitely include women leaders, and I, I'm very, very proud of women, women leaders. Even those I, those I completely disagree with, I'm ex absolutely proud of them. One of them is a Nobel Peace Prize winner, and the others are just amazing leaders in all different parties. Um, and the young people, they're, they're truly, truly amazing. I, I, I work with some of them, and the young people, men and women, are truly amazing. So we need to find a way to include them and to expand the cake so it's a, it's a, a better way to, to approach it. And he said this all uh, by himself. His wife didn't make him say it. <laughs> She's buzzing me right now. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I fully agree. I think really the men have failed. Uh, let's ask the women. Uh, now, on the, the, the reason men dominate on the ground is because there's a war going on and they're the ones who are doing the fighting. And therefore, the GCC and others think of the warlords and how we can reconcile them. And the women are not among those. But if you look at civil society, if you look and most of them are outside the country, most of the leaders of civil society and many of the journalists among Yemenis are women. And they're doing an amazing job. And I think the future belongs to them. Once the guns fall silent, these are the people who are going to lead the future Yemen. I mean, one of the great failings of the transition that the GCC put in motion in 2011, 2012, was that it cut out all the new grassroots voices Absolutely. that had made the uprising possible. Absolutely. And it became a change of elites, of course, to minimize the fallout for the GCC and for the Saudis in particular, who had been concerned at the possibility of losing control over a transition in a strategically vital corner of the Arabian Peninsula. And so I think we're continually seeing the after effects of those decisions when the transition was, uh, was limited and excluded so many individuals and groups. Okay, let's conclude with uh, this question from uh, Beth Solomon, uh, CARE USA, addressed to all three of you panelists. Do you see any parallels between the plight uh, of uh, Yemenis and, and that of the Palestinians? What is there to learn? What is there to avoid from that? Anybody wants to start with 
<laughs> the Palestinians always want to bring up this question, um, don't me, they? Yeah. Um, <laughs> let, me, let me just comment <laughs> Thanks. On, 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 this, on this from uh, a perspective of Palestinian, Beth. Um, I was in Palestine recently a few times, and um, uh, Palestinians understand the plight of the Yemenis probably more than anybody else. Um, being bombed in Gaza, uh, having a blockade, uh, and what they go through. So I'm not going to compare the two, but if the Palestinians understand and sympathize with what the Yemenis are going through, on average, more than other Arabs, let alone other people uh, globally, um, it tells a story for me. Yeah, I mean, I, it, uh, the two are, are so different, of course, uh, historically. And, but in terms of suffering, yes. In terms of the blockade that Yemen has been experiencing, if you look at Gaza, it has been totally landlocked, uh, 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 block, blockaded from every direction. Uh, the West Bank is all like Swiss cheese, you know, with these small communities uh, completely uh, surrounded. So the suffering is the same. Uh, <clears throat> I would say the difference is that Saudi Arabia, no matter what its ambitions are and no matter what the new young reforming uh, dominant force in the region is, and I say that very tongue in cheek, I hope you understand, <laughs> Uh, will never dominate Yemen the way Israel has dominated the Palestinians. No matter what his aspirations are, the Yemenis will simply not allow it. Uh, and that gives me hope that eventually uh, foreign influences will leave and Yemenis will be uh, a free and democratic society. Oh, I would just agree with that, I think. Gaza is, I mean, from a physical size, it's, you know, the Israelis' ability to control and to blockade is, you, know, you simply cannot replicate that with a country the size of Yemen for the, and, the, and the Saudi capability. And so I agree, if, I mean, the blockade already is, is not absolute. And uh, there will be pressure on the Saudis for humanitarian reasons. And of course, the Yemen plight is taking place in our 21st century age of constant communication, where it's much harder to keep uh, to keep things hidden. Uh, things go around social media within seconds, and so that I think also means that for the Palestinians, at least, it took almost 20 years before they even began to get a voice in the international arena. Uh, whereas with Yemen, we already see a lot of humanitarian and growing political anger at what the plight is. And so I think that's, that's also very different. Nino Khalil, yes. not, a, not a single question in Iran. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you convinced them. That's <laughs> All right, thank you, uh, gentlemen, very much. Uh, let me just make a couple of uh, announcements. Um, one is uh, our next event will be here across the hall, actually. Uh, next Tuesday, a week uh, from today, dealing with this last issue that was raised, uh, U.S. policy with regards to the recent changes with regards to Jerusalem uh, and Palestine and the impact of that on peacemaking in the region and, and what have you, an excellent, uh, equally excellent panel uh, like the one we had uh, today to deal with this issue. And then the next event after that would be April 17, which would be a joint event uh, between the Arab Center and BCARS. This is the Boston Consortium of Universities teaching Middle East, Harvard and, and MIT and so on. Uh, and that will be on reconstruction in Syria. So um, thank you for being in touch, for being here. We will stay in touch. Hope to see you at uh, future events. Thank you very much. Thank you.